opposed to kind of by land use areas because I thought that, that, that this would be something interesting. Everybody assumes, we're back to assumptions again, right? Assumptions do what? Make a you-know-what out of you and me and you, right? Um, we all assume that uh, in the suburban setting or in the urban setting, bees aren't exposed to anything. But we really didn't know that. The other thing is, are there certain months in the year where, where honeybees are more likely to get exposed uh, to pesticides that could negatively affect them or not. Uh, so that's kind of what we tried to look we tried to look at with this grant. <coughs> I better get my liquid filled honey candy so that I can continue my presentation. <laughs> so <clears throat> How land use affects the, the quantity and concentration of pesticides found in fresh stored pollen in honey beehives. Um, that's a mouthful, right? So why do we do this? A lot of media about pesticides and bees. Many beekeepers say pesticides killed their bees, ignoring Varroa's effect on their hive. I run into that all the time, okay? Uh, we wondered if land use influenced pesticide exposure to honey beehives. We also wondered if month of year influenced pesticide exposure to honeybee hives. Uh, those are some questions that no one, I never heard anybody present anything about that before. So I thought it might be something that we could try here. And we wrote up a, an application, we got funded for it, and this is kind of what we did. In 2015, we had five different land use types, and here they are, forest, urban, suburban, Agricultural corn soy, agricultural vegetable production. And that was the prime, the, the predominant use of the land in that area. All right? So the goal was to collect samples on a monthly basis and to pool those samples together. So, for example, everybody that had a hive that was in a forest area, I collected pollen from each one of those hives and pooled it together in one sample to submit to the national laboratory. $360 a sample to run for a scan of 180 different pesticides, okay? Um, five apiaries per sample, uh, and wanted to do it for six months, only got five months done because just towards the end, things got to be too much. Okay, procedure, we started out, we surveyed members of the NJBA using the survey monkey tool that Janet referenced earlier uh, to see if they would be interested, be willing to volunteer a hive in an apiary allow me to enter at my convenience. That means I didn't have to clear it with them first. I could go whatever day was convenient for me because otherwise I'd have to call 25 people and make appointments and I'm not into doing that. I gotta be honest with you. I get no joy out of that. So I would just, like the wind, blow in one day for 20 minutes, half hour and blow back out, right? Um, they had to give us their GPS coordinates so we could determine what the land use was around that, that, in particular, that particular apiary. And then uh, we had a guy from uh, Stockton who I met at a beekeepers meeting down there who was a graduate student and his specialty just so happened to be GIS stuff and he happened to be very interested in beekeeping and he happened to volunteer his time or I know I guess he didn't volunteer his time but he did give us his time and his expertise pretty cheap. Um, so he analyzed the sites to kind of, and then gave me a report as to uh, who had the highest percentages of each of these land use types, okay? Then I contacted the beekeeper and planned the routes. There were four routes, south, central, northwest, and northeast. To do them all, 893 miles, 24 hours of driving, about a half hour per site to collect the sample packet and get going, okay? A lot of work, a lot of work. Um, this was the percent range of land use. And when, when you look at the results, and Dean and I kind of talked about this, one of the things that bothered me is this is a relatively low level. That means only 62% of that land was predominantly forest, which may explain why we found some agricultural uh, chemicals in the forest um, samples. Um, also 56, not really, that, that was a little bit on the low side as well. The, the rest of them were, were pretty good. Okay, um, 
We started out thinking we could go with what with the mild coverage, but New Jersey is so dense and so diverse that I really couldn't get any good numbers at the mile level. That's why we backed it off to the half mile radius around the apiary. <clears throat> so this is a this is a, a, a wonderful map made by a non-IT guy so that you can kind of get an idea as to what's going on. At about you know, 12 o'clock two nights ago, p.m. or a.m. or whatever it is then. So this is the outline of New Jersey, of course. And here's my southern route. That was up in Bass River State Park, that one. And then these ones were kind of down across the south. Here was a central. This one was a killer. Because I ended up in Crestkill, New Jersey, which, man, I didn't even know that that place existed. <laughs> One, remember the night that the, the, the truck blew up and burned the bridge on the New Jersey Turnpike? It took me 15 hours to get home that night. It was crazy. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible day. The day that would never end for me, right? And then this was the north, the northwest one. Okay, and that was a long one, but that was beautiful country all corn fields. Most of those guys were all in the corn soy one, okay? Very nice going up there. <clears throat> so here, is, here we are collecting pollen. We do it very similar to how we did it with Dean's study. Is we'd fi I'd find a frame that was mostly fresh pollen. I didn't really want wet stored pollen. I wanted it to be relatively dry. The reason being is that that's the same procedure we use when collecting pollen samples for the uh, National Honeybee Survey. So I was hoping that, I, you know, I have three years of, of results on colonies that were part of the National Honeybee Survey, and I wanted to see how these equated to, the, to those samples over time. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet, but that's one of the reasons I wanted to kind of follow their procedures. So we would take these little, these are like wooden coffee stirrers. They fit perfectly inside of a cell, tease out a nice big pellet of pollen, put it in the, the test tube, and there'd be a test tube for each of the land types, okay? I'd check off every one of the collections so I knew when the samples were all collected, and then off they go overnighted down to the USDA laboratory in Gastonia, North Carolina. Okay? So, uh, just like uh, some of the other things that Dean reported, these are the mite treatments that we found, okay? And thymol, uh, which we found both in, in May, 301 parts per billion, August, 2,310 parts per billion, and September, 1,750 parts per billion. That was thymol. Fluvalinate, um, and I'll just say a little something about fluvalinate. Fluvalinate is a mite control. Uh, I tested it a couple years ago when I worked with some commercial beekeepers in New Jersey to see what was most effective. And the apistan strip, or fluvalinate, not effective for controlling varroa mites. I would not recommend you use it, okay? Even though it's, it's still sold, but it's not effective. Um, so it's a contact pesticide. And another reason is fluvalinate can interact with other things and make them more toxic, as Dean reported. It's another reason to be very cautious or to not use it. It doesn't work for varroa, and it can cause a lot of other problems if you put it in your hive. So in May, we found 11 parts per billion, June 2.2, July 3.4, August 19.3, September zero. So, you know, was this in the colonies because of new wax? You know, I don't really know why. I'm just kind of giving you an idea as to what, what I found. And then the last is this DNPF, which is a metabolite of amitraz, um, 91 parts per billion. 30.6 parts per billion and 14. So um, this is really a high one, okay, kind of an outlier. Um, so those were the mite treatments that were found. Yeah. This is the number of pesticides by month, not counting mite treatments. This is just the, the pesticides that we found that were not mite treatments. And this is kind of interesting to me. May, we found two. And those pesticides were atrazine and metribuzine. Atrazine is used as an herbicide in um, agricultural production. And May is kind of the planting time for corn, generally speaking. Um, but this metribuzine 
There's also a, um, a herbicide, but that was found in the urban samples. Why that was, I don't know. Lawn care. Well, it could be lawn care, I guess. Lawn care, is he using lawn care? Okay. So both of them in May. June is when we found the neo, one neonicotinoid, imidacloprid, and that was in, I thought that was interesting, that was in the suburban land use area. Imidacloprid was found there. In July, we found four pesticides, and these are all the ones, um, much higher levels of this, this tip. Yeah, however you say it. Um, you can buy imidacloprid from Home Depot. It's free, and they impregnate the uh, fertilizers with it. Oh, it's in the fertilizer, too? Mix it in with the fertilizer, you have to spread across your lawn and your lawn spreader, and then Joe Holmar can just go put as much out as they want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, we found four in July, and then in August 10, and it was primarily in the ag vegetable area and the forest that we found all of these. And quite frankly, as I was saying, I'm very suspicious that around one, of the, one or two of those forest sites, um, there must have been some vegetable production going on. And then in September, there were no pesticides found other than um, a few of the, of the mite controlling pesticides, which I think is kind of interesting. This says to me, July and August is the time when uh, honeybees are more likely to bring pesticides in pollen back into their hive. Um, and when I think about it, and, and I, I'm just you know kind of spitballing, if you will, as I think about it, there's much less competition early in the season. There's trees, there's bushes, uh, there's, there's hay fields that really don't get much pesticide application to them. Um, but in August, it's the dearth period. There's pretty much not, not really anything else going on. And most of the farms, like vegetable farms, are irrigated. And um, if any of it goes to bloom, the bees would much more likely be hitting those, farm, those fields rather than the wasteland out there with nothing for them to do. Okay. Yes. How do you know? You might have How do you know that the pesticides that collected in August were from you guys? Were the pesticides that the bees collected? Were the pollen that the bees collected in August, and that wasn't sitting there since May? Because I was looking for freshly um, stored pollen. I wasn't picking pieces of uh, bee bread that had honey over top of it. It was the fresh pollen. That's one of the reasons I was trying to do that. If I was to do this over again and had a lot of money, I'd buy a pollen trap for every one of the locations. And what I would do is I would have to contact the beekeeper and have them set the pollen trap to collect fresh pollen four or five days before I go so that I would get it right out of the trap. That would do two things. It would make sure it was fresh and that it wasn't contaminated by anything that could be in the wax inside of the comb. See what I mean? Um, so, yeah, good question. Yes, Dave. Tim, I'm looking at all these, these um, contaminants. Would you recommend that I eat any of the pollen that comes out of my colony at this time? I don't know, Dave, because here's one of the things that we don't know. Uh, there are parts per billion levels in here, and as far as I'm aware, there's, a, there's, there's not a lot of information that will tell me how many parts per billion of X will harm a honeybee adult or a honeybee larva, and how many parts per billion of X will harm me. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah. The other thing I don't know is, as this gentleman over here asked a question about 25 or 30 years ago, what were the part per billion levels in the very same beehives. You follow what I'm saying? They did not have the Varroa issue associated with them back then. Um, were they able to stay strong even being exposed to pesticides without Varroa? Okay, so there's a lot of unanswered questions and you know this is why we need research and we need research dollars because they're all good questions. Yeah, would I eat pollen? I mean I eat some pollen but I didn't test it before I ate it. Then again, I ate this honey cough drop. <laughs> I didn't test that before I ate it either, you know what I mean? 
So I, I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. Herbicides. Uh, we found three herbicides. This is by class of pesticide, and these were the levels. This seemed pretty high, 245 part per billion, way higher than 4.2 part per billion. Okay, and that was on, in August on vegetables, 245 part per billion. Um, you know, a part, one part per billion, you know what, how, what, how that equates to your life? One second in 35 years of life. Okay? But then when you start getting up into the hundreds and thousands of parts per billion, that's, that gets a little scary to me because I don't know the answers to those questions. Will it affect me? Okay? Fungicides here are the seven fungicides that we found. And I highlighted these because they were all one, over 100 parts per billion. And these were the months we found them and the land type we found them on. Okay? Captain was on both ag corn soy and ag vegetable. Um, this one, trifloxystrobin, uh, ag vegetable. And this one, um, ag vegetable, July and August. Okay? Oh, and also in the forest sample, we had that as well. And this was the, high, the highest level of them that I found, I'm pretty sure. Seven fungicides. Tim, a question for you? Yeah. Uh, do you know what types of crops those uh, 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 fungicides were used on? Were they tomato crops? Were they... Uh... Oh, yeah, they're, they're labeled for use on a whole myriad of crops. Okay. But I don't know exactly which crops they were used on. Okay. Because I don't know all what crops are grown in those areas. Um, so, uh, four insecticides, imidacloprid, 2.2 parts per billion, um, and you can see the other ones, uh, 47.3 part per billion. That seems pretty high to me. Um, but, you know, the things we don't know are very much what Dean alluded to or, or mentioned, is you mix a, a fungicide with one of these and how much more toxic does it become? I don't know. Uh, you mix fluvalinate with one of these in a beehive, and, and what does that do? I don't know. This is why these are some of the, the, the questions that need to be researched and need to be answered as we move forward. Number of pesticides by land use. Um, in the forest area, we found five. Urban area, one. Suburban, one. Corn, soy, five. Vegetable, eight. And the highest levels by land use were the vegetable and the forest. Okay? And I'm very suspicious that the forest was... You know, maybe the half mile was mostly forest, but right outside of that may well have been vegetable farms. I'm not really sure, okay? Because I was expecting the forest to be clean, to be honest with you. That's what I was expecting. Conclusions, honeybees are bringing chemicals back into the hive. The worst month, in the, according to this study, is August, then July is the second worst month. The worst land use area is near vegetable farms, and then corn soy, and then forest. Very little is found in May, June, and September, okay? And you know what? A lot more work is needed. A lot more work is needed on all, the, on all these kind of things, okay? And that's all I got to say, unless you guys got some more questions. I know you all probably want to go home. I don't blame you. I do too. How's that? <laughs> <laughs>